Good afternoon, Ms. West. Hello. My name is Kevin Goff. I represent Marky Elkins in this case. And I have a few questions for you. Ready? Yes. A direct reflectum showing what's been marked defendants exhibit six. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Defendants Exhibit 6. Take a minute to review that for me. Ma'am, if you is approximately 50 or 60 pages worth of photographs, would you take a minute and examine it for me? Ma'am, have you had an opportunity to uh, examine? Defendant's Exhibit 6? Yes. And you've seen that exhibit before, haven't you? Yes. The first time you saw those photographs was on the evening of March 21, 2013 at the Glen County Police Department, the evening that your child, Antonio Santiago, tragically lost his life. I believe so. And to be clear, um, have you observed any of the proceedings in this trial? No. Now, is it fair to say that of all the people in that pile of pictures or composite of pictures, that the first picture on top is the picture that clearly stands out to you as the one closest to the shooter? Yes. And uh, that's not a surprise. I've asked you that question before, haven't I? Yes. Your answer was the same the last time, was it not? Yes. And at that time, you put a check mark on that first picture. Yes. That check mark is still present there today. Yes. Do any of those pictures look like the little boy? I never saw the little boy. So the only picture in there that looks like any, either of the attackers, is the first picture, and you believe that looks most like the shooter? Yes. And Ms. West, a after you made that identification the last time we were in court, did you have occasion to speak with the district attorneys about who you identified? I'm sorry? After you previously identified the first picture, did you have an opportunity to discuss your identification with the district attorney or her assistants? I discussed a lot of pictures with them. Well, you, as you sit here, you're aware that the photo that you identified was that of Dominique Lang. No, I wasn't aware of that. Would it surprise you that you identified Dominic Lang? Yes. You would agree if you never got a look at, the, at the, the, the little boy, if you never had a look at his face, what are the odds of all those pictures that you would pick out his? I'm not sure. Is it possible, ma'am, that you may be mistaken in identifying Mr. Elkins as the shooter? Is it not possible that the shooter is, in fact, the individual that you picked out of that set of pictures, Dominique Lang. No, M Mr. Elkins was standing two feet in front of me. And Mr. Lang was standing right behind him? Yes. But yet, you could see all of Mr. Elkins' facial features. That is your testimony today? I've seen both boys walking towards me down Ellis Street. Well, you'd agree that the little boy wasn't hiding behind the other the entire way up the street. That's a couple hundred feet. Right. Okay. And you'd agree that when they were running away, he wasn't trying to hide behind the other one? Actually, it wasn't a couple hundred feet. It was probably about maybe 30 or 40 feet. Okay. Can you think of any reason why you would be identifying Dominique Lang this morning rather than Marky Elkins as the shooter? 
Maybe I saw both of them. Well, ma'am, if you don't remember what you saw, then how would it help you identify Dominique Lang? I remember seeing two boys. Is there any reason why you're so adamant that it can't be the very individual that you just identified? Because I remember Mr. Elkins pointing a gun in my face. Now, do you remember talking to CNN, specifically CNN reporter Nick Valencia, at your residence on the morning of March 22nd? I spoke to many reporters. They were kind of camped outside your, your apartment, weren't they? Quite often. In fact, uh, you, uh, you complained about them, I think, at one point, did you not? No, I, I just couldn't answer the door all the time. I couldn't walk to the door. But you advised uh, Mr. Valencia and the other reporters that were present that you had been to the police station the night before, which would be the night your son was shot, and you were able, you looked at some pictures of kids that were not in school, and you were able to narrow it down to, to two people. Yes. But you couldn't decide which one it was. No, I identified the shooter. Well, ma'am, do you see the picture of Marky Elkins anywhere in there? No. Okay. Well, which set of photographs are you referring to? There were lots of photographs I've looked at. But on the evening of March 21st, you were looking at pictures of what you understood to be truants, individuals who were not in school. Mr. Elkins, from what I was aware of, wasn't in school. He was in a GED program. Okay. So are you telling the jury that Mr. Elkins' picture is in that composite exhibit? I don't recall. Do you know why the police department reports say you were unable to identify anyone on the evening of March 21st? I don't remember them saying that. You were speaking with Angie Smith on March 21st, weren't you, and Detective Marissa Tyndall? I identified the shooter. You met with the police, the, those two police officers, for approximately two hours on the evening of March 21st, did you not? It was a long time. Well, if the video showed that it was approximately two hours and 14 minutes, that would sound about right to you. Possibly. Now, you've seen that video, haven't you? Several. Well, you've seen that video several times, haven't you? No. Never reviewed that tape? With I've reviewed it once. reviewed it once, okay. You are not shown any photographs during the course of that two-hour interview, are you? I've seen several photos, more than that. During the two-hour interview that was recorded on the evening of March 21st, you are not shown any pictures in the recorded interview. Could you repeat that question? Ma'am, I'll repeat the question. On the evening of March 21st, when you were interviewed by the Glen County Police Department for two hours, during the recorded part, two hours that you spoke with them, they did not show you any pictures. They spoke with me first, and then they showed me photos. Okay, so they turned the cameras off before they showed you the photos. I'm not sure. Well, you've seen the video, you'd agree that them showing you those pictures is not... I was unaware that I was being filmed. You were unaware? Yes. So if the police officer, if Detective Smith reported that you were unable to identify anyone on the evening of March 21st, that would be untrue. Excuse me? I object. You don't put the testimony of one witness against another and ask this witness to determine whether or not the witness testimony of another person is untrue. That is Same. what the decide. I'll rephrase. If Detective Smith testified that you were unable to identify any suspects on the evening of March 21st, would that statement be incorrect or mistaken? She told me who I identified when I picked out the one who shot my baby. Now you're referring to the identification that took place the following morning at your residence. No, I identified him at Glen County Police Department the night that it happened. You're sure about that? Yes, I'm sure. Well, then why, if you'd already identified the shooter, and you, you, you're saying you've, you identified Mr. Elkins as the shooter, positively the night before? 
I believe so. And why would you later tell reporters that you'd only been able to narrow it down to two and you weren't sure? Because I was unable to see the second boy very clearly. When you spoke with the police on the evening of March 21st, they discussed having you meet with a sketch artist the next day. Yes? Only if I couldn't find the photo of the boy and identify him. But they did specifically discuss you setting up a meeting with a sketch artist. No, they, they, they mentioned it. And you repeated to the reporters that were at your house that you had, in fact, been scheduled to meet with a sketch artist because you hadn't made a positive ID. That's incorrect. I told reporters that I did identify the shooter. Well, if you told them at that time that you had identified the shooter, then why would you still be talking about seeing a sketch artist? We weren't. After I identified the shooter, they knew who they were looking for. And your testimony is that you positively identified Mr. Elkins on the evening of March 21st? I do believe so. And that the police... Oh, okay. Okay. Let me re rephrase. Let the record reflect I'm showing what's been marked as Senate Exhibit 4 to the state. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? May. Ms. West, I'll show you what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 4. For the uh, photo spread with an identification by you. <clears throat> Have you seen that document before? Yes. Okay. What is the date and time on the identification form? March 22nd. At, what time? at 1400 hours. That would be 2 p.m. on Friday, March 22nd? That's correct. The day after your son was shot? I believe so. The morning after you went to the Glynn County Police Department? Yes. Are you telling this jury that there was another identification process done the evening before, separate and apart from that one, and separate and apart from the document that is currently circulating through the jury box? I'm not sure. Okay. As I said, there were several photos. But the first formal photo spread, where six people were put on a page and you were asked to pick one, the first formal photo spread was not done until 2 p.m. on March 22nd, was it? This one right here was done the next day at my home. Okay. Whereas I, I did identify the shooter. But well, we'll come back to that in a minute. But it, it, as you sit here now, do you have any explanation as to how you picked out Dominique Wang from the pictures you were shown the night before? No. There's no possibility that you could be mistaken in your identification of Marky Elkins? No, not at all. Well, there have been times when you were unsure about your identification of Marky Elkins. Never. When the police were at your house showing you what's been marked Defendant's Exhibit 4, you were not certain at that time, were you? As you compare States Exhibit 45 to what was previously presented to you as Defendant's Exhibit 4, are those in fact the same document? It looks like it. And your answers with respect to State's Exhibit 45 would be the same as your answers regarding Defendant's 4? <coughs> yes. Okay. Ma'am, I've got a delicate subject to discuss with you, and my apologies for doing it and doing so in such a public fashion. But I do have to ask you whether you suffer from mental illness of any kind. Yes. All right. One of the mental illnesses from which you suffer is what's known as bipolar disorder or manic depression? Bipolar. Another is post-traumatic stress disorder? Yes. 
Another is borderline personality disorder. Yes. Another is paranoia. Yes. And do you not also suffer from schizophrenia? No. Have you not admitted to suffering from, from suffering from schizophrenia to family members? No. And to treat those illnesses, you take a variety of medications? Two. One of those medications is Tegretol? Yes. All right. And does Tegretol have other names? Do you know? I believe it's Carbamazepine. Carbamazepine, am I correct? Yes. C-A-R-B-A-M-A-Z-E-P-I-N-E? -E. I believe so. Ma'am, correct me if I'm wrong, but you are a, a woman of letters, so to speak? I'm sorry? You are a woman of letters, so to speak? I don't know what you mean. You have attended and graduated from high school? Yes. And you have, in fact, attended uh, college? Some. You attended, how many colleges did you attend? Two. And their names are? Stratford Career Institute and Ashworth College. One of those is in New Jersey? One's in Washington, D.C., and one's here in Norcross, Georgia. All right. Uh, and you studied, or you majored in psychology? I studied some psychology, yes. Okay. Now, um, I take it you take your health fairly seriously? Yes. So when doctors prescribe medication for you, you is it fair to say that you review the contents uh, on the labels? Yes. And when the doctors prescribe these medications for you, they do the same with you, or their nurse does. I'm sorry? And when you were prescribed these medications, the physician that did so reviewed with you the side effects and other precautions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Prescribing carbamazepine. And I'll ask you to take a moment to look at that. And ma'am, directing your attention to, and I don't mean to rush you, ma'am, um, the drug, the generic drug known as carbamazepine and pop, more popularly known as Tegretol is known to have a side effect uh, of causing abnormal behaviors. That's what it says. It may cause people to have suicidal thoughts or tendencies to become more depressed. That's what it says. And that's consistent with your recollection of the labeling on the package? I believe so. Directing you down to the um, sixth paragraph, this medicine will add to the effects of alcohol and other CNS depressants. And down below it says pain med medicine or narcotics. That's correct. And then the, uh, I guess it's technically the third to last paragraph in the middle. It may also cause blurred or double vision in some people. Yes. Moving three pages later again, it refers to a side effect as blurred vision or double vision. Yes. And on page 20 of 22, which would be the third from the last page, Rare symptoms include visual hallucination, in parentheses, seeing things that are not there. I see that. And on the very last page, it, it, it reflects loss of memory and problems with memory as potential issues. Do you recall whether, in fact, you were advised by the physician or laboring on the product that taking that product could interfere or cause loss of memory or problems with memory? I don't recall. Which would be consistent with the alleged side effect? I don't recall. Now, you take a second drug, and the second drug is gabapentin? Yes. 
I'm sorry, gabapentin, G-A-B-A-P-E-N-T-I-N. <laughs> you never call whether, uh, uh, now I can't even remember how to pronounce it, gabapentin uh, may also cause some people to be agitated or irritable or display other abnormal behaviors. That's what it says. May also cause some people to have suicidal thoughts and tendencies or to become more depressed. Yes, that's what it says. And that would be consistent with the warnings that you read and which were given to you when the drug was prescribed. Yes. Directing your attention to the f next paragraph, the medicine will add to the effects of alcohol and prescription pain medicine or narcotics. That's what it says. Is that, in fact, your recollection of what you were told? I'm sorry? That consistent with what you were told when it was prescribed for you? The pharmacy gave me a printout. Gabapentin may also cause, directing your attention to the fourth paragraph, may also cause vision changes and trouble with thinking. Yes. Directing your attention to page 10. More common side effects include delusions and dementia. That's what it says. And on the next page, impaired vision. That's what it says. Ma'am, is it not fair to say that there are all other medical issues which impact your ability to identify uh, witnesses or see things? No. Do you not suffer from impaired vision? Um, my vision has improved. Vision has improved? Yes. Okay. Well, I notice you're not wearing glasses today, but you are. That's correct. I hate to give away women's secrets, but you are wearing corrective lenses. That's correct. Even with those corrective lenses, what vision do you have? I'm not sure. Not 2020, though. Not anymore. Be fair, it probably never will be. I'm sorry? Be fair, it probably never will be. Probably not. Your cornea uh, in one of your eyes was, was uh, injured previously? Quite a while ago. And I take it that damage is not, it has not recovered, sad to say. There's a permanent scar on my left cornea. Now, when the detectives, Smith and Tyndall, interviewed you at the Glynn County Police Department, you were unsure whether you'd be able to identify anyone. That's not true. Did you not uh, state, quote unquote, you might recognize the one? I don't recall. Ma'am, you do recall the police officers questioning whether this crime took place the way that you say it did. You remember that very well, don't you? My injury don't infract my vision that much. That's a good answer to the last question, but it wasn't the one I actually asked you. You do remember very well ugly confrontation between you and the police officers, or what became an ugly confrontation, when they suggested that there were no black men at the scene of the crime. No, I don't recall that. Don't recall Detective Sindel saying, I'm just asking? I remember just telling them about what happened. About 112 minutes into that video, you were asked, what if the video shows there weren't two black males? Do you remember that question? I believe so. 
And you answered, I know there is a lot of corruption in the world, but that isn't going to change who I am. I don't recall that. Well, they asked you the same question a second time, didn't they, a few minutes later? As, as politely as they could, but they nevertheless pressed you a second time on that question. You don't remember that. Could you repeat that? What if the video shows there weren't two black males? What was your second answer? Then it was wrong, because there were two black males. And to be clear, which, do, you, do you recall which video we're talking about? They asked me about um, the video in the road. I'm sorry? They asked me about a video in the road, if there were cameras. In, at 708 Ellis Street. I believe so. They suggested to you that one of the homeowners had video cameras on their house. That's correct. Now, the second time they asked you whether it was possible there were not two black males, you threatened to sue the police. I don't recall that. You don't recall saying, I will make sure color of law violations are taken to federal district court? I don't recall. Well, ma'am, you, you, you don't recall whether you threatened to sue them? No. Uh, is it fair to say you've been involved in your fair share of litigation? Ma'am, let's talk about what you were doing on the morning of the shooting. We can. Um, well, hold on. I'm sorry. Before I go there, um, do you remember being confronted with statements from several witnesses, confronted by the detective Smith and Tyndall, particularly Detective Tyndall, about statements from several witnesses at the scene who said they did not see any black people on that street corner. There weren't several witnesses on the scene. There were only two that I remember. You remember at least one woman, yes? Yes, in the yellow house. Big, tall, white fella. With gray hair. You now know his name is Samuel Van Eden. I'm not aware of that. Well, one moment. Ma'am, do you remember the big, tall, white gentleman with the yellow shirt depicted in those three photographs? I've seen several people that day. Well, was this not the gentleman who made the 911 call on your behalf? Actually, the woman in the yellow house made the call. He went over to ask her to call. You asked him for help, and he went and got someone to call 911. I believe that was the gentleman. That's the gentleman with the South African accent? I'm not sure. I just remember he had gray hair, bushy, and a gray beard. Do you remember the detective asking you how his statement could reconcile with yours? He wasn't in the road until after my baby was shot. Ma'am, yeah, I'm directing your attention to the state's exhibit 53. It reports to be a map of the city of Brunswick. Uh, do you see the intersection of London and Ellis Street on the map? And if so, is there something marking it? A red push pin. A red push pin. All right. And did not the detectives tell you there was a witness who claimed that they were walking up from the 800 block of Ellis Street at the time of the shooting. I didn't see anyone on the road. There wasn't anyone in the road. Ma'am, we can agree, can we not, that Ellis Street itself, from the, the, the gentleman the reenactment video, Ellis Street itself is a fairly clear <clears throat> field of vision up and down the street. Does it not? Yes. And that field of view extends across the intersection up Ellis Street. He didn't show up until after my baby was shot. Right. And that's why the detectives were asking these questions, wasn't it? That's standard procedure. Because you would agree if Mr. Van Eden was bicycling up 
from the 800 block of Ellis Street with his dog, and he didn't see any black people at any time on Ellis Street or crossing Ellis Street. That that's, that's because they I'm ran. Sorry, let me finish my. This this is a courtroom. It's not a game show, but uh, you don't want to answer the question before. Okay. Let me finish this question. You would agree that if Mr. Eden was walking north on the 800 or bicycling north on the 800 block of Ellis Street, and he saw no black people crossing the street, that no black people ran east on London Street. You would agree. No, no, object to that. That is clearly argument what Mr. Van Eden saw and what he might have seen and whether the conclusion is because he didn't see them, if in fact he didn't, that that means there weren't any. That's an argument. That's not a question to this witness that is proper on cross-examination. I object to it on the basis it's argumentative. Your Honor, it's not only not argumentative, but it's simply recounting the conversation that she's having with the detectives. I'm not the first person to ask any of these questions in this case. All we've done is taken the same questions the police department started with, and we're just following them through to their conclusion. I'm going to sustain the objection as to, as, as to that particular question. You can re-ask it in a more simplified, less compound manner. Okay. Ma'am. Take it one step at a time. Were you not asked how... Did, did the detectives not ask you for help and understanding how he could be where he claims he was and have missed these people. Do you recall them asking you for help, their help? At them asking you for help, addressing that question? I believe so. Your answer was he wasn't there. No, that's incorrect. He didn't exist? No, he was there after they ran. If he saw you in front of him turn the corner, then he would have had to have seen what happened. Your Honor, objection, argumentative. Any objection. And then, the detectives, did they not also point out that there were two other witnesses in the house next door? They did talk to you about those witnesses, too, didn't they? I don't recall. You don't recall them talking to you about two women, an older and a younger, looking out the windows of the house and not seeing anything on Ellis Street? That's because the boys ran. Maybe they did. But my question for you is this. After the detectives suggested to you that your statement didn't align with those of other witnesses, you backed off of your identification evidence, your identification testimony, didn't you? No, I, I believe I said that that was the man that shot my baby. Detective Tyndall asked you, are you sure it was a black male? Uh, you responded by saying that the shooter had his head down. No, I, that's incorrect. You never told the detective that the shooter had his head down? Never. You didn't also suggest at that time that there was an issue with the early morning lighting? I never said that. You didn't imply that the early morning lighting might have interfered with your ability to make an identification? No. Ma'am, can we agree that Dominique Lang is not a dwarf? He's a young man. He's, he's not an older man. Can we agree that Dominique Lang is not a dwarf? I'm not sure. Acknowledge that he's not a dwarf? I'm not his pediatrician. Ma'am, have you seen Wizard of Oz? Yes, that's fiction. Well, the dwarves playing the characters in The Wizard of Oz, those were real people. You recall that. I'm sorry? Uh, the uh, state will stipulate that dwarves are people. Now, if the state will stipulate that Miss West knows what dwarves look like when she refers to people as dwarves, we can read that. 
<laughs> if Miss West would, would, not, if would not talk about oh, dwarves. Oh, oh, oh. Court reporter cannot get this down. One person at a time, please. All right. Your Honor, the state has to live with the testimony that they, they've elicited through their investigation. They can't, they can't one day throw out that the, the Mr. Gall, person... I'm going to overrule his objection, allow you to question her because she used that term. Okay, but we're not going to stay here forever. Okay? Thank you, Your Honor. Ma'am, can you not agree that Dominique Lang does not look like a dwarf? I'm still not sure. I don't know his genetic makeup. Can you agree that he looks to be considerably older than five or six? I haven't seen him in this courtroom. You've seen his reenactment video, haven't you? I don't recall that. The DA has never shown you Dominique Lang's reenactment video that was made the same day you made yours? I don't recall. And let me ask you this. You do follow the media coverage of this case, do you not? No, I don't have cable. Do you have a television? Yes, I watch DVDs. No. Tell us, Jerry, that you've never seen a picture of Dominique Klein. From the police, I believe. Yeah, we know you've seen at least one picture of Dominique Lang, don't we? Yes. Do you not agree that he doesn't look five or six? From a headshot? No, I can't tell that. All right, now let's talk about the post office for a few minutes. Is it not true that prior to March 21st, prior to the death of Antonio Santiago, that you were afraid to go out? I was injured. Were you or were you not? afraid to go outside. I was at the hospital. Before the shooting, ma'am. Yes, March 18th. Did you not tell CNN and other reporters that you were afraid to go outside? After my baby was shot. Did you not tell them that you had been in hiding? I don't recall that. That the hiding had not worked for you. I don't recall that. You don't recall saying that you were afraid of people in New Jersey who were involved in the death of your older son? I mentioned that my son was killed. And you didn't merely mention that your son was killed that the killings were related? No, I never said that. You never suggested to anyone that the killings were related? No. You never suggested that one of the other individuals renting in your apartment complex who had been evicted because you complained about her crack cocaine use? You didn't she was angry. You didn't suggest at that time that you thought she was involved in the death of Antonio Santiago and your older son, Sean Glassy, in the state of New Jersey? No, I never suggested that. Well, you'd agree that that would be absolutely crazy, wouldn't you? Objection, Your Honor, it's argumentative. Anytime you demand the witness agree with a conclusion is an argumentative question, and I cite Rule 611A. Any objection? Anytime you ask the witness to agree to a conclusion, Your Honor, is a leading question. Court has ruled. So on the morning of March 21st, you were not afraid to go out? No. Now, it was cold, you said? Yes. You needed to mail a letter? Yes. But in fact, there is a mailbox 
at the front door of your apartment, is there not? Yes. And I approach witness again with 50, you may. 53. Can you point out where your apartment is in relation to the red push pin that you've already referenced as the crime scene? Would that be somewhere to the southwest of the red pin, somewhere in the middle uh, of the uh, Union the Street? Block. The 900 block yes. of Union Street. And that would be somewhere here. I yes. So. Okay. Now, for the benefit of the jury, could you point out where the post office is? Mm, this way. Well, let me ask you this: Where is Gloucester Street in relationship to your residence? I don't see that sign. Do you see a gold pin uh, up well north of your residence? Top of Ellis Street? It looks yellow to me. Yellow, okay. If you go up to the red push pin on Ellis Street, you come up to the post office. Is that right? I didn't realize it was that far. Yes, in fact, it is somewhat far, isn't it? Yes. <clears throat> and aside from the mailbox in the front of your apartment, there are mailboxes down here at the Hopkins Homes Housing Project, are there not? I'm sorry? There are mailboxes down at the Hopkins Homes Housing Project with, with, to which the silver pin is in the middle of the project. I don't walk that way. Okay. But you'd agree it's closer. I'm not certain. Well, ma'am. If I could ask you to take a moment and just visually compare the distance between the red push pin at the scene of that uh, of the uh, incident and your house to its southwest and the gold marker at the post office, compare the distance between that same residence of your location and Hopkins Homes public housing project, you'd agree that the Hopkins Homes project is far closer. I'm not familiar with Hopkins Homes. Are you aware of a housing project down on Prince Street? No. You've never, you're, you're unaware that there's a housing project only two blocks away from you to the southwest? I've never seen a sign that said it. Okay, well, whether you knew the name of it or not, you knew there was a housing project there. There are. Okay. Now, there's also a mail drop on Union Street, is there not? I don't believe so. Are you, are you familiar with City Drive? Yes. That's where a lot of people pay bills, isn't it? Yes. And in fact, there's a post office box out front. I've never mailed a letter from there. Let me ask you this. You would agree that Ellis Street is a side street, would you not? Uh, city Trash Collection picks up trash there. Side street and the main street? Yes. Okay. Is it fair to describe Ellis Street as a side street? I believe so. Okay. Now, Union Street, the street on which you actually live, that's not a side street, is it? You mean Union Street? I don't believe that's a main road. Man, have you ever taken the tour of homes in the city of Brunswick? No. Section, you're on irrelevant. I believe main roads are state highways. Okay. Is it fair to say that Union Street is one of the main north-south corridors in the city of Brunswick? It's a large road. Okay. With lots of pretty historic houses on it. Objection, Your Honor, irrelevant. It's hardly oh, irrelevant. Right. You would agree that it is a, a main street with lots of historic homes? Yes. All right. Meanwhile, Ellis Street actually has almost a block of boarded up houses on it. Um, they're actually, I think, for sale. They're foreclosed, I believe. Yeah, the houses with the 
plywood sheeting over the windows. Your understanding is those are for sale? I believe I've heard that from someone. It, would you not agree if you were looking for a safe place to walk, to mail your envelopes, you'd be walking up the street you live on? No, Your Honor, I object. We are now on the basis of irrelevance. It's this witness's fault because she didn't walk on a street that was not safe enough. That's the most ridiculous thing I've heard. It's irrelevant to the guilt or innocence of the accused in this case. What street in Brunswick she chose to walk her baby on. And because she chose one that had nice, beautiful houses that were Victorian, whatever, as opposed to one that was boarded up or that were in foreclosure, she somehow took the wrong street and it's her fault. I object to this. There's no relevance. It's not probative to any issue in this case what street she walked on. She can walk on any street in Brunswick she wants to. I don't mind Mr. Cobbler trying my case for me as long as my client appreciates the outcome. But I do object to him constantly interrupting my examination uh, on fairly routine questions. Well, he's got a right to object. What's, uh, what's your response to his objections to relevancy of what street she walked on? Your Honor, the credibility of the witness's story depends on the geography. I'll rule the objection. I didn't proceed with it. Well, you need to repeat the question. Do you not agree that Ellis Street has at least one block that is mostly boarded up houses? Well, well it's actually a side street off of Ellis. Okay. And that side street is full of boarded up houses? Some. Ma'am, today you testified that you needed to go to the post office to get stamps? I believe I needed a stamp. In all your interviews with the police department, and all the statements you've made about this case, today is the very first time you've ever used the word stamp, isn't it? Well, that would be connected to a post office. Ma'am, if you needed stamps, did you have another way to get your stamps without walking your child through the cold up to the post office? Not that day. Did you not talk to Luis Santiago earlier that morning? Yes. And did Mr. Santiago not offer to go buy things for you that morning? Yes. And in fact, you gave him a list of things to pick up for you that morning? No. You asked him to pick things up for your baby? No, he sometimes did that anyway. But he spoke with you that morning before he went to pick things up? Yes. It didn't occur to you? Oh, by the way, he indicated to you that he had a car that morning? <sighs> he had friends with cars. He had a friend with a car that morning that was going to take him to Walmart. I believe so. That's what he told you. I believe so. In fact, he came by that morning, didn't he? Before you went to the post office? Yes. He was there at your residence in the 900 block of Union Street, a half block away from the scene of the crime, within an hour of the shooting. He was on my front porch, and I was busy with the baby. You didn't ask him to get some stamps? No. You didn't ask him to mail your envelope? I thought he might have been busy. Ma'am, if he wasn't too busy to go to Walmart to get things for you, then why would he be too busy to buy you a stamp? I had no idea he was going to Walmart. Well, when you spoke with him that morning, an hour before the shooting, where did he tell you he was going? He didn't say. He just offered to go to the post office for me. You declined his offer to go to the post office for you? I wanted to take a walk to get exercise. In the cold? I was from the north, and it's very cold up north, and I figured if my baby and I ever went to visit, he would be used to the cold. 
right? it's cold or not, it's still a high crime, high drug area, isn't it? I'm not aware of that. Now I am. <laughs> really, you weren't aware of that? No, I wasn't. With all those nice homes. All right. You're right. At this time, we have a uh, video that we need to play. Man, let me know when you see yourself in the video. Oh, is that you right there? Do you see yourself coming up, Ellis? Oh, you've stopped. Do you see yourself stationary? I believe so. According to the timestamp, that was 2.45 into the video. I walk that road a lot with my baby. Yes. On this particular morning, uh, were you aware that the post office video cameras extended that far away from the building? No, I wasn't aware of that. You thought you were off camera. I actually didn't think about it. Well, um, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're there almost motionless with your child. What are you waiting for? I must have been arranging his clothing. A block away from the post office in the cold, you decided to stop to arrange his clothing? I've done that often. Or are you on the phone talking to someone? Isn't that your hand moving as if you're putting your phone back? I might have got a call. You might have gotten a call. Okay. And now you're moving again. Thank you, Mr. Lockwood. And who were you talking to, ma'am? I actually um, had several calls that came in when I walked that road. One of those calls was with, was with Luis Santiago? I'm not sure if it was that morning or another morning. Can't tell us, Jerry, who you were talking to about 30 minutes before your child was gunned down on a public street? I actually don't remember bringing my phone because I believed that I was coming right home. Okay, but you did see your hand uh, on the side of your body going up and down. Well, I'm in a lot of pain when I walk. I have spine damage. Well, then why did you let Mr. Santiago take care of the stamp? exercise. I didn't get out much. All right. Let's talk a minute about the Gerber life insurance policy. Okay. Now, you've been quick to point out that you spent the money on the uh, Funeral. I'm sorry, it wasn't really a funeral, was it? It was a service for Antonio Santiago. A private service. Okay, and that's because he was cremated or was he buried in the cemetery? He was cremated. His father wanted his remains. Cremated the day after the body was returned to you? Um, the, they transported the body to the funeral. You called your daughter, Ashley Glassy, the same night as your child was killed. Isn't that correct? At some point. <clears throat> At some point that night you called her. I'm not sure what night it was. Well, did you read her, the newspaper accounts of what she had to say the next day? No. Well, ma'am, if you didn't read the newspaper accounts of what she had to say about you, why did you call her and tell her not to talk to anyone? Because I, I believe that the reporters would talk to her, and I did, she was in grief. Okay, hold on a second. Your daughter, Ashley, was in grief over the death of Antonio Santiago? No, over her father. And what happened to her father on the same day? No, he had died in 2009. 
So she was still in grief four years later from the death of her father. So that's why you told her not to speak with the media about the death of your child and about your conversation with her the night your child was killed. She had just lost her grandmother also. A year before. Some people take time to grieve. Had Miss Glassy expressed any mourning to you during that telephone call that night? I don't recall. You, re you do recall calling her that night, don't you? I remember speaking to her at some point. You called her on her cell phone, didn't you? Uh, she usually had a cell phone, yes. She put you on speakerphone with her and her boyfriend. I'm not certain of that. You were aware there was someone else in the car with her while you were having this conversation. Uh, I believe her, her boyfriend did say, I'm sorry for your loss. And, of course, you described to Ashley that children had killed Antonio. I said young men. You said children. I don't recall that. Well, they expressed surprise at your description of the attackers, didn't they? Objection, Your Honor. Surprise is irrelevant. Thing. Ma'am, the purpose of that phone call was not to console Ashley Glassy over the death of her grandmother the year before or her father in 2009. The call had an entirely different purpose, didn't it? If I called her, it may have been to tell her what happened. And for what other purpose did you make the call? To tell her about the services. Really? You, you, you were telling her about the services? That, that may have came up, that there would be services. You told your daughter she was forbidden from attending the services for Antonio Santiago. I never you said that. You told her you didn't want her here. No, I never said that. I did mention that it's dangerous here and I didn't want her to visit. So you didn't want her to come down? I didn't want her to visit in, in this area. Did you want her to attend the service or not? I, I didn't, no. Okay. I didn't want to lose another child. Okay. You mean like you lost Sean and Antonio? That's correct. You asked Ashley, Ashley Glassy how quickly you could obtain money on the Gerber life insurance policy. That's why you called her and that's what you asked her. That's not true. In fact, you knew that there was a life insurance policy on Ashley Glassy's grandmother. You were aware of that, weren't you? Ashley mentioned it. She had mentioned it previously, hadn't she? Yes. You were aware that she'd already collected on a life insurance claim you called her to ask her how long it would take. I don't recall that. And you recall that question didn't go over very well with your daughter, did it? I never asked her that. I don't recall that. Okay. Well, you're aware she went and spoke to the media after your phone call. I, I heard. And that's why you called her to tell her not to talk to the media anymore. I asked her not to. Just like you asked Luis Santiago not to talk to investigators from the public defender's office. I don't recall. He said he, he received a subpoena. And you don't recall him hiding in your house from officers of the public defender's office? Um, he walked over to tell me that he was subpoenaed. And he was inside your house while investigators were outside and he refused to come to the door. No, I don't recall that. 
You don't recall yelling at him? Lewis, just tell them you don't know anything. I don't recall that. <laughs> you recall saying anything like that? I said that he may be questioned in court. But you didn't want, her, didn't want him answering any questions that day, did you? I mentioned that he may be subpoenaed. Why were you so concerned that he not speak to the public defender's office about this case? I wasn't really concerned about that. What were you concerned about? Were you concerned that he might be charged with a crime? Were you protecting him? No. Now, the value of the Gerber life insurance policy, as it turns out, was only $5,000. That's correct. But it was a policy that increased in value, did it not? At age 18. Through childhood. Through childhood. I'm sorry? It was a policy that increased in value through childhood. Only at age 18 it doubled. You didn't actually know how much the policy was worth until you called the insurance company? No, I knew. Well, you had filed more than one application for insurance, hadn't you? No, just that one. Did you two separate insurance policies with two separate policy numbers? One was mine. Now, do you recall calling Gerber Life Insurance Company the following morning? I believe so. That would have been around 9.44 Eastern Standard Time? I believe so. Basically, you called the life insurance company as soon as they opened the next morning. I was told that the coroner wanted the body shipped to the funeral home. Okay. Now, Mr. Economo was just asking you earlier about victim witness assistance. You, you know what victim witness assistance is. I'm not aware of all their services. But you know they have some services. Yes. And they offer to provide you services in this case. Yes. And the only reason that you were in, in any financial urgency to get money to bury your child was after your daughter contacted the media and started talking about this life insurance policy. I don't understand your question. You didn't need the insurance company proceeds to bury Antonio Santiago. There were plenty, pe plenty of people willing to step forward, including victim witness assistance. That's correct. You chose to spend the life insurance money for that purpose when funds were available out of concern for how it looked when your daughter went to the newspapers. No. Ma'am, let's talk a moment about guns, okay? About what? About guns. Okay. All right. I, I know that's a, a difficult subject, and uh, if it'll make you feel better, I'm going to take this gun here, and I'm going to ask the clerk if we can put it down below where you don't have to look at it, okay? I want you to be able to focus on my questions. And if at any time you're having difficulty understanding my questions or you need a break for any reason,